Tom Landry, it has been said, he does not coach football games, he presides over them. Uh, Landry may appear outwardly aloof, but no one coaches in the NFL for 27 years or wins with such regularity without an ability to deal with people, uh, to share their moments of laughter and sorrow. Tom Landry has earned success coaching players who were tobacco chewers, angry young men, good old boys, wild extroverts, even impassioned poets. But so seldom does Landry express his feelings publicly that sometimes it's easy to forget that this calculating football genius is also a sensitive man of flesh and blood. The hole in Texas Stadium is not as big as the hole in any theory that attempts to explain Tom Landry, the most perplexing personality in the National Football League. No one has penetrated the gunfighter stare, the grim face that makes him look like a regional director of the FBI, or a brooding hammer. Who is the man under the hat? The man who can do more with one look than with a thousand words. He does with, uh, with a certain look what other coaches have to yell and scream and, and find players about it. And he's got several different looks. He's got one that tells you that he's angry, one that says, okay, you got away with it this time, but don't do it again. His physical reaction would appear to others as more of uh, disgust. Uh, when he sees something and he's angry, he'll usually give you the... To paraphrase Rudyard Kipling, Landry keeps his head when all those about him are losing theirs. His outward emotions are slight and subtle. His body language, a mere whisper compared to other coaches. He's really an emotional man. I mean, he does better with his emotions than a lot of other people. He probably doesn't show them out outwardly like a lot of people like for him to do, but uh, he shows his team how he feels, and that's all that really matters, because his team is his life. The first time a cowboy team saw the inner man revealed came in 1966. Dallas lost a crucial game to the Pittsburgh Steelers, and Landry's stoic mask cracked in the locker room. You know, he just came in and his heart just opened up and he cried and, you know, tears came out and he got us all in there and he said, fellas, it's not your fault, it's my fault. And uh, he said, I don't know if I'll be with the Cowboys next year. A tremendously emotional experience for all of us and that was the turning point, I think, of the Dallas Cowboys. From then on, the Cowboys have been in the playoffs all but one year. No one ever questioned Landry's ability with X's and O's. What they doubted from the beginning was his understanding of flesh and blood. Honky-tonk quarterback Don Meredith was a free spirit who drove Landry to distraction. The hands that wrote North Dallas 40 belonged to Pete Gent. A golden boy named Lance Renzel had deep-rooted emotional problems. Quarterbacking the Cowboys was a humbling experience for Craig Morton. Number 14 arrived in 1965 as a strong-armed All-American. He left 10 years later with his body intact, but his psyche ravaged, overwhelmed by Tom Landry. Well, in the, the early years, I was, I think I was intimidated by him um, because he wanted to make me successful. Nothing I really did was, was right. Um, and when you come out of an atmosphere when you're in college that everything you do is right at that level, and you're an All-American, then you come from All-American to All-Nothing, and nothing you do is right. Uh, it kind of put me back in a little shell a little bit. I don't think I was assertive. I don't think that I was the leader that I was capable of being. He demands discipline. I don't care if you have a Heisman Trophy winner coming off campus into his system, if you have a free agent like myself coming off a college campus into his system. Uh, he expects the same out of every player. Critics disagree, saying Landry employs a double standard. He tolerated the antics of a hot dog named Thomas Hollywood Henderson. The player who tested him the most was a mercurial talent named Dwayne Thomas. Drafted number one in 1970, Thomas was a loner, but a man most experts conceded was the second coming of Jimmy Brown. Number 33 ridiculed Landry, calling him a plastic man and openly criticized cowboy management. 
part of the Tao system of motivation is through fear. And what I mean by fear is that uh, uh, if you don't do your job, you're not going to be here. You see? So I understood what the premise was. The premise was what? Performance. So if the premise is performance, well, then the pay should be performance. Thomas created a divisive force among both the players and coaches, but he led them to a world championship in 1971. Did Landry coddle Thomas, or was this a sign that he was mellowing, more aware of an individual's needs? I think that Tom did use it uh, a double standard, but I don't think that's a weakness. I think it's a strength, and everybody understood that. Dwayne had some problems that he had to deal with, and, and Coach Landry was willing to, to help deal with them. Well, I had very little patience with people who didn't want to be the best, and I was very demanding. I think I've changed through the years. Uh, I became a Christian uh, a couple of years before I joined the Cowboys as a coach, and this, is, this has made a big difference in my life through the years that I've coached football. Uh, I'm much more tolerant. I enjoy it much more. I, I have a, a greater feeling for players now than I've ever had before, and so I think that makes you coach different and, and feel different, and I think it's good. I think the biggest misconception the public has about Coach Landry is the fact that he's not a personable man. Uh, he tells jokes in the meetings. He's very lively, even though no one laughs at his jokes. Well, one, one year, some guys, I think it was Bob Rooney and some more guys, I think maybe Danny White was involved in hired a, a lady to come in and sing happy birthday to him with the old Tinkerbell uniform on, and she got time to dance with her and stuff in front of the, in front of the team. And it was, it was real funny. I just... We never thought he'd do it. He just had a great time. Rarely has this glacier melted. It is a side of Tom Landry only his players have witnessed and shared. Roger Starbuck, Landry's most brilliant disciple, led Dallas twice to Super Bowl victories, and when he retired in 1979, gave voice to sentiments long held by Cowboy players. The system, uh was successful before me. It's been successful in the 70s with me and it'll be successful without me. Of course, the nuts and bolts of the Dallas Cowboys is, uh... <coughs> a man that wears a funny hat on the sidelines. Tom Landry is a very, very great... He's a great football coach, maybe the greatest football coach that's ever lived. Everything that he does, he does it the right way. And he's a, a person that everybody can look to. As a Personally, he has been a guy that has been a I think the way in which he's conducted himself, you know, in every facet of, uh, of the National Football League has been something that I've tried to follow. He's a he's the kind of guy you don't want your daughter to marry. Most of his players, when they leave the team, pretty much know how to handle themselves in the uh, other world other than professional football because Coach Landry has trained us so well. Thomas Wade Landry, the man under the hat. When he exits pro football, he will leave a brilliant legacy both as a coach and as a man.